Good afternoon, this is Gary Kavner here on TRSI. I'm here today with my friend and colleague Michael Dwyer on a Monday as this is a bank holiday so I hope you haven't missed us too much over the last day. Michael, how have you been? I've been fine, Gary, and how are you? You're making sure to ask that like right off the bat so I can't edit in 10 seconds of silence again? I have to say, I kind of appreciated the dedication to smallness and pettiness that you actually went back, having already edited the previous show, and re-edited it in order to put in the silence. I thought that was a a commitment to being a small and petty man in order to make me look bad, which I, I, I have to give you a certain amount of applause for that. Yep. A surprising amount of people thought their phones had broken. <laughs> it turns out 10 seconds of silence on a podcast sounds really long. It is an eternity. Anyway, I'm going to repeat the question. How have you been, Gary? I've been quite good. I've been quite good. In the middle of trying to renovate a house, so that's taking a lot of my uh, a lot of my weekends. But it's actually surprisingly um, surprisingly good work. Feels pretty good to actually do something with your hands, and there is a sort of sense of um, accomplishment as you uh, you know you work ahead in it. Yeah, like milking cows. I've never touched a cow, so I can only imagine that that's accurate. Well, I have, and it is. Cows are nice. They're not sheep. Sheep are horrible. Cows are nice. Cows have nice eyes and big eyelashes. Anyway, I don't think the people are terribly interested in our opinions about cows. They're probably not that interested about our opinions about most things, any, but let's face it, they're, they have to listen to something when they're out for a walk. Yes, so in a, what I think was a quite a, a coup for Michael, or sorry, a coup for Gript <laughs> even. Although, Michael, a coup for Gript is a coup for you. Absolutely. I'm on the sidelines cheering you boys on. And occasionally doing some work. Mm. There's a certain segment of the left who respond to anything Grip publishes by just saying, who cares? You never report anything you know, important. This is just nonsense. So it was quite nice to have one of my stories on the front page of the Irish Times during the week. And not just on the front page, but above the fold, which for those of you who are under about 35, means that when it's on, when the newspaper, the physical newspaper, is sitting on a shelf, above the fold is the things that you can see when the newspaper is is still folded in half. That's where you want to be. That's where you want to be, yeah. Uh, If you want to be on printed media, which, to be honest, I don't. But if you did, that would be where you'd want to be. It was in relation to a um, a documents that I had acquired through FOI, which were from the Department of Finance. They laid out a lot of the background to how the amendments for the referendum were worded, kind of how they were put together, what was... taught about them internally, particularly how the Department of Finance felt. And if I could sum up how the Department of Finance felt, they didn't like it, they didn't like it at all. And they felt that other people should know they didn't like it. Yes. But it was covered by the Irish Times. The Irish Times were given a copy of our documents. And then I believe they went to the department and because they had the original FOI and the reference numbers and things like that, I believe they then asked the department either you know, to verify them or submitted exactly the same FOI in order to get an instant response so that they could word it in such a way where they didn't just have to say the documents came from Gript. Okay. Which, you know, is their choice. Would have been a lot easier to just say as first reported by Gript, but you can't have everything, Michael. Well, maybe they made an editorial decision, which was simply this, that their readership if they saw reported by Gript attached to the story, would discount the story and not consider it to be, what's the word, verisimile, very true, what it will say, or accurate or something like that. And therefore they thought that since they wanted to run the story, they had to do it themselves and not taint it with the word script. I mean, entirely possible, but they did give us what I think was the most strangely worded sort of credit I've ever seen. It felt like a typo. That's because there was a typo in it. Oh, okay. There was a typo in it, and it also appeared in the exact same form at two different points of the article, which usually indicates that something, Michael, is a very late addition to the piece and is being moved around by editors. Okay. So, you know, there's some sort of discussion about it. And what was the... How would one say... What was the recognition? What was the indication from whence this story had come? It was, um, this is the exact phrase. The finance records released first to Gripped website were covered by a freedom of information request from the Irish Times and provided to the paper by the department. Which kind of sounds like there were an amount of people who thought, just give Grip the credit because it's their story and it's their documents. 
an amount of people who didn't want to give us any credit, and a compromise was achieved at the last minute. Hence why it's in broken English. It's a really awkward, weird kind of phrasing, isn't it? First appeared on gripped websites. Other than the fact that it has a slightly Slavic sense to it because they've decided not to use any kind of articles, definite or indefinite. It's just grip the website. But also, it's as if it kind of just appeared there in some kind of quantum event. It appeared there and then the Irish Times went off to the department and got it, just in case. Very, very oddly phrased. I like the idea that the Irish Times, or certain people in the Irish Times, didn't want to just use the phrase, the story first reported by Grip or documents acquired by Grip show. Yeah. And instead basically put in their own freedom of information request just so they could get something to say, you know, we also had the documents. It wasn't just, you know, gripped. Even though, Michael, it was. Even though it was. Anyway, for the the tiny number of people out there, Gary, who have read neither your article nor the reportage on your article or the uh, FOI fro- that they got from the department... What was the the sense of the the discussion about the language and the choice of language for the amendments? It's actually, it's quite interesting in, with an FOI you always get kind of a fragmented view of things because things are going to slip through the cracks. But this, you got a fairly comprehensive idea of how the discussion had changed over time. So it mostly focused on the CARE referendum. Yeah. And initially you get the Citizens Assembly say that there should be a particular wording there to place an obligation upon the state. Yeah. And it goes to the Joint Oireachtas Committee and they agree that there should be wording to say that there should be an obligation upon the state. And then it goes to the Cabinet Committee. Now, Cabinet Committees are basically committees which are formed by high-ranking ministers and maybe some external people and you know, like the Attorney General might sit in it, things like that. Mm -hmm. And they're basically a subgrouping of the Cabinet to focus on a particular issue. And one of them was handling this and and how this should be worded. And you can see the conversation starts off with, this will place obligations on us, and this is what was recommended to us. And then very rapidly go into, but we'd rather not have obligations on us. Do you think the Department of Finance had some of their sticky fingers over that kind of positioning? Well, it's clear Department, uh, the Department of Finance does not want this. They, they think it's, it's way out there. Um, they are fairly frank about that. But you get the sense a lot of people don't want this. Like the advice that this contains from the Attorney General about socioeconomic rights being enshrined in the Constitution yes. is quite strong. I think he's probably right on that. And to be honest, I think a lot of what the Department of Finance were saying were right. I think the real problem that this creates for the government is not so much the strength of the argumentation internally as to whether or not it was right that this should be done. It's the variance between what we now know is being said internally and what was being said externally. So I suppose just to touch on this point for those who haven't seen it, what the files showed was that the wording of the referendum, the the wording and the idea of strive Mm. and the exact form of it, They were designed to replace a previous wording because it was said that the term would give uh, concrete and mandatory obligations on the state. So these documents explicitly say that, that the strive wording was designed to ensure that it would avoid a concrete and mandatory obligation on the state um, explicitly. Then there's also a really interesting thing they did with the Irish translation of the referendum um, of the proposed amendment where strive is in the constitution once already, but it's in a part of the constitution that cannot be considered by the court. And the government decided they wanted to translate strive in a different way in the second time they were putting it in. Instead of translating it in a technical or direct way, translating into a word which could mean strive, but could also mean like a hope or a longing. And we know from the attorney general's advice that they were told that doing so would create a problem because the Irish constitution states that if there is a conflict between what the English version of the constitution and the Irish version of the constitution say, the Irish version takes precedence. Yes. And so the thinking here, I believe, Michael, now this isn't explicitly said, but this is my, shall we say, educated opinion of this, is that that was a deliberate choice so that 
they had designed this to make it as difficult as possible for someone to bring a court case under this and for them to lose. But then they also put that in so that if you brought a case, the first line of defense would have been pointing out that actually the Irish does not say anything that could be construed at, with with any sort of definitiveness as being an obligation, but is instead, you know, a longing or a hope. Mm-hmm. And therefore, yeah. a court would not accept, uh, they wouldn't lose um, if a case was brought against them. I think that's pretty explicitly what they were doing. And I think they put a considerable amount of time and effort into doing it. And then they came out and um, kind of seems like they just bullshitted people. But pretty directly. The language used was not congruent with what they were doing internally. Yeah, Obviously, the concern would have been, it seems, in the in these discussions and in, in discussions during the campaign leading up to the vote, was that in both cases that the language it was problematic, that it was vague and it was unpredictable. So if you put in the word strive, so if there's going to be a court case, they're going to go and say, well, strive, and the court would have to decide what that meant and to what degree it could be regarded as imposing an actual concrete obligation on the state to do any one thing in particular. So the, the by the choice of the Irish word, that seems, I, listen, maybe they weren't being as clever or as sneaky or as underhand as one might think they are, but let's give them the credit that they, they deserve and say that they were in fact being consciously clever about this by saying, well, if we want to understand the word strive, let's look at the the word in Irish. I can't remember what it was. Was it dream? Whatever dream. it was. Yeah. Uh, uh, which from the commentary from Irish speakers seems to suggest that it has a, a less, it has a more aspirational longing, that sort of not concrete sense to it. And they would say, well, that, this t- this gives us a sense of what the constitution means by strive. So it's, it, it, it could take away the obligation. But my memory is, and again, maybe if we went back and parsed the language of those people who were saying this kind of thing during the referendum campaign, that they were actually careful in how they said it. But my memory was, the sense they were giving was that the re- one reason to vote for this amendment was that it was actually going to create more protections or uh, more protections for carers or more obligations on the, on the half of the state for carers that it was actually going to achieve something concrete if what we're saying is correct it's hard to see that there is any substantive practical change would have been achieved by chain by passing the amendment yeah, the documents note that their the Department of Finance didn't want any of these changes. They wanted it either, if a change had to happen, they wanted it either deleted and nothing put in, or they wanted just, you know, a generic statement that care was important. Right. With no, nothing like that. They note that even the strive wording is likely to bring about a great deal of legal challenges. Now, the strive wording seems basically designed to mean that they wouldn't have lost those challenges, but they would have still had to deal with them. Yes. So the department is making points about how, you know, are we going to spend millions just defending ourselves on this? Um, And so let's not do that at all. But you can see actually through the documents, the gradual weakening of it, with each step kind of being, you know, back a bit and back a bit and back a bit until you go, okay, well, now we've got an option that we're just not going to lose on. Mm -hmm. And that was very clearly where the focus of this was and the Cabinet Committee. I think some of the ministers were careful as to what they said about this, but not all of them. Some of them were quite explicit on where this would put obligations. One thing that was interesting, actually, I went back through the Law Society's uh, statement they put out when they came out in support of both of these referendums. Mm Mm-hmm. And I couldn't say definitively, but I think they were aware of the issues with this for for this reason. Inside the department um, and in the cabinet committee, when they were considering these things, they made a big deal of the difference between recognition and obligation. Recognition was fine. Obligation was a legal problem. And when you go through the Law Society's statement on this, 
They don't ever mention obligation, even though that was being talked about publicly. They only ever say recognition. So I suspect that the Law Society, or more accurately, the Council of the Law Society, was aware that there was a distinction here. Well, in a sense, you'd hope they would be, I mean, <laughs> as lawyers. Yes, you, you would hope they would be. But then again, you know, Michael, if you're going to come out fully in support of something and you are, you know, you are the legal professional's trade body and there is a lot of discussion about what would this mean legally and there seems to be a lot of discussion which is clearly wrong. Yeah. You would hope that there would be some mention of, well, we have concerns here or this is exactly what this would mean. Yeah. Mostly because you'd assume it's the position of you know, the law society, even where it's going to take a position because it believes it to be the legally correct position to also have somewhat of a duty to say if there are any legal issues that might arise due to that or any legal misunderstandings that are currently being discussed. Because the law society is fundamentally not a advocacy institution. No, it's not. I mean, maybe what they could have made an observation that certain comments that were being made in the in the debate around the wording maybe were less than accurate or displayed a lack of understanding of what the the wording of the amendment would actually achieve and simply from a, a, a from the perspective as lawyers that they should have taken the opportunity to clarify that that since there was a certain amount of confusion even amongst government ministers and government spokespersons, that this was an opportunity for them to say, well, by the way, as it stands, we're talking here about recognition. We're not talking about obligation. The language as written will not impose obligations, but will give recognition. You know, in the last episode, Michael, we were talking about whether or not ministers had lied to the public based on what we'd seen of the Attorney General's advice. And we were saying that, you know, Lying is very separate from saying something that's incorrect. Yes. And that there was a lot of ambiguity here. That a lot of a lot of what people were <clears throat> were complaining about was not actually indicative that they were ignorant of the proposals. It was indicative of the fact that no one could know what the proposals were going to lead to because it was going to be left to the courts. And the courts are ultimately an adversarial system, so it depends what cases are brought forward mm-hmm. and what arguments are made. But I think there were certain things in the Attorney General's advice which made several statements by ministers look pretty bad. But there was one other quote I wanted to give you in light of the documents we now have, and it was made by Leo Varadkar. Ortier reported it on the 12th of February. And it was this. A yes vote would oblige the state to support carers. Hmm. He says it would place an additional and stronger obligation on future governments to support carers. That is hard to square with the documents that we have seen. It does seem quite hard to square, doesn't it? I'll give you an exact quote, Michael, from one of the documents. And this is a a briefing paper for the Cabinet Committee. And it's based on a series of papers that were passed around between the Cabinet Committee. And it's summarising those papers. And... Here's its description of the option that was put to the to the people. In summary, this option is intended to avoid a concrete and mandatory obligation to provide support. Do you know the word that jumps out at one there, Gary, is the word avoid? Yeah, but it, it's interesting that that, it seems to be saying, Michael, something nearly absolutely opposed to what the Taoiseach is now saying. And this document came... You'd be interested to know this, Michael. This document was sent around on November of 2023, which, if I remember correctly, Michael, is at least several months before Leo Varadkar said this. Uh, when I say avoid jumps out, and uh, I'm not just being smart arts, I mean, they could have said this language will not create obligations or this language is far less likely to create obligations. But by the use of the word avoid, it injects a degree of agency and directedness in the language. That this is something which is an, in, there is an intentionality at, at work here. We are looking to avoid this. 
the full sentence actually to avoid a concrete and mandatory obligation to provide support as opposed to the previous reasonable measures language. Now, reasonable measures was what was put forward by the Citizens Assembly and by the Joint Directors. So it's it's clearly in place for that reason. And yeah, so Leo Radker explicitly coming out and telling people that it would place obligations to provide support when the Cabinet Committee, which Leo Radker was in, is saying, actually, we've designed this to avoid that. It's not a great look, Michael, on the whole, did you lie to the public about a referendum question? It's also perhaps a strong reminder that if you are going to design a you know, constitutional amendment in order to avoid putting obligations on the state, do not ask civil servants to write you a paper on how you can do that. <laughs> yeah, that seems like a fairly good piece of advice. I'm just like... <laughs> Or maybe ask the civil servants, don't say things like, you know, in summary, we want this to avoid putting obligations on us. That's just language you don't need. Yeah, n- next next time, keep this, keep that in mind. So I did actually during the week uh, try this. I didn't get anywhere, which is one of the reasons we passed the documents to various people. Not just the Times, we gave them to a number of other uh, newspapers, um, just with the you know, just credit gripped if you use them, basically. And it was this, I reached out to all of the organizations I could think of, the care organizations who came behind the Yes, Yes campaign and just wrote to them and said, listen, I presume you supported this because you honestly believed that it was, you know, at least a partial victory in that it would place obligations upon the state. So therefore, how do you feel to know that the state designed it specifically to make sure that that didn't happen? And also asking, you know, did anyone from the state talk to you about this? And did they tell you Mm -hmm. that it was going to put obligations upon it? Which is one of those questions where, you know, you want to ask people their honest opinion, but you have to phrase it very formally, because if you phrase it in any way form informally, it starts to sound like, and do you feel like a gobshite now? (laughs) But none of them got back to us. So when none of them got back to us, we thought, okay, well, just give the documents out because then anyone can ask. And while they can ignore us, it's a lot more difficult to ignore the Independent or the Irish Times or anything like that. And we should probably have a bit more of a conversation about this because it kind of looks like the state may have, you know, explicitly lied to people and constructed a constitutional amendment, uh, you know, at best, shall we say, um, dishonestly. And at worst, pretty out there. Anyway, Leo, at times, I don't know. Do you think sometimes Leo gets in a funny mood? He decides to troll people. Um, I think our friends already adverted to it, but I just wanted to very briefly mention, since it the day that's in it, I, I suppose you saw the comment that Leo made about St. Patrick was a single male undocumented migrant. Yeah, that's a. We were talking about Finnegan moves before in the last. I think in the last podcast, Michael. Yeah, that's a real Finnegan move of a. You know, I'm going to say something kind of smart, and as long as no one thinks about it, we're uh, we're going to be fine here. Like, first of all, as I'm sure other people have noted before, when Patrick arrives here, according his to his confessions anyway, which is the source that we have about the life of Saint Patrick. When he arrived here, he was 16 years old and he had been kidnapped and enslaved by Irish pirates and ended up up in, I think it was a Schlemish or somewhere up in the north of Ireland as a, uh, a pig herder where he stayed for a number of years until he eventually got away. Now, I don't think being kidnapped by pirates really makes you an undocumented migrant. Secondly... Simple. I mean, I've just been a bit of a prick here, but anyway, why not? Why why break the habits of a lifetime, Gary? When he returns as a bishop, he first of all undocumented, Gary. How common were passports in four thirty two A.D. Would you say? How many people were documented in Europe? Well, it might it might shock you, Michael, but. 
Throughout most, even up to most of modern human history, passports were not a standard thing because it turns out when travel is quite difficult, it's actually relatively easy to keep track of people. Fairly easy. Ironically, Patrick was probably one of the more documented people when he arrived in Ireland the second time because he had a letter with him from the Pope because he, he the, who sent him to Ireland to mission, on, on, to preach to or to... To, to serve those Christians already in Ireland. Now, at the time, having a letter from the Pope was as, probably as close as you're going to get for a lot of people to having a doc, a document, shall we say, certainly as, as it goes for letters of introduction, it wasn't bad. It's just pathetic, isn't it? It's just so adolescent. It's like a 14 year old debating point. What does it? What does it advance? What does it say? All it does is it takes hold of Patrick because it's coming up and he's going over to America and going to give some shamrock to the, to the president. So everybody's talking about Patrick. So let's let's use him. It's just thin. It's smart alecky, but it 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 in no way speaks to the reality of the problems that we're we're seeing today. Or the poor unfortunates that are, have were lined up in tents on Mount Street until they were told, no, it is time now to go to Sockert. But remember, Gary, and I think it's important we know this, they were not cleared out of Mount, Mount Street because say, the St. Patrick's Day uh, festival was approaching and there were going to be a lot of foreigners walking around the city centre, and indeed Irish people. It was out of concern for their health they were going to be sent to a place where they would be in better conditions in the, I think, former nursing home out in Sockert. So anybody thinking that they were just cleared out because it was a bad optic would be wrong. The odd, the bad optic, Gary, happens when we see video of the same people abandoning their much better position in Sockert and walking their way back into town. The whole thing is just a shambles. And here... Here is my question to you, which I'm sure has occurred to other people, but I haven't in most of the discussions here, I've heard people talk about, isn't it shocking that we're bringing people over, we're, we're, we're inviting asylum seekers in, we're bringing people in, and we have nowhere to put them. It's wrong and it's cruel and it's inhumane, and we shouldn't be putting people into conditions like this. And all of that is true. But how did it get to the point in the first place, Gary, that you had the whole amount street covered in tents. So let's let's go to a more controversial example here, Michael. Why you sometimes have to let people drown? Oh, Gary. Yeah. So it's very easy to say you will save everyone and everyone should come here. But at some point, you hit a resource constraint of some kind. And then you start running into trouble because you've nowhere to put people or you've no way to care for them. Or the fact that you're taking in people causes more people to come, expediting the entire process. Uh, but Gary, hold on now. They're not coming because we're, there's a, there are pull factors. They're coming here because of climate change. Because the Taoiseach said so. Okay, yeah, I'm going to be perfectly honest about that. That falls into the category of bullshit that's very easy to say. And which you can say safe in the knowledge that basically no one, apart from maybe a gripped reporter, or maybe someone from the Independent or News Talk, if they're feeling a bit fighty, might actually <laughs> say, and do you have any evidence for that? Is Or is that just some shit you made up? So if you notice, uh, if, the, if you are listening and you notice a sudden change in audio quality there, it's because I attempted to go on a rant about how exactly what we've seen in Ireland was related to what we've seen in the Mediterranean and the deaths that were caused there by the triumph of hope over experience, and my entire system blacked out after Michael made a pitiful moaning sound. <laughs> Maybe it was your computer coming to your rescue. Maybe so. Maybe so. Just another time progressives have killed people and we just don't get to talk about it. Yeah, well, it's uh, the, the creation of pers perverse incentives, I suppose, is what you were going to talk about, Gary. No, I, I suppose on the on the story about migrants being moved, there seems to be some degree of uncertainty as to where exactly they were moved, the circumstances they were moved. It seems to have been basically a campsite somewhere up the mountains 
a number of them then seem to have come down. So on the case itself, it is admittedly kind of funny as well that it was done right before St. Patrick's Day. I did see some mention from, I believe, Charlie Flanagan that such an action would have required ministerial sign-off, which is also perhaps not great. It hasn't been a great week for the government, Michael, or even a great two weeks for the government on stuff that I think would fall into the, if this wasn't a coalition government, would probably kill the minister. Like, we're seeing ministers just take wounds that should put them down, and everyone is just politely ignoring it. Mm. Like, if you could, if you stood back from the Mount Street encampment, uh, the substantive issue around it regarding asylum seekers and immigration and how, what we should be doing with them, what we shouldn't be doing, whatever. But just look at simply as an exercise in competence. It's a shit show. It's a shit show. It's a shit show that it was allowed to occur in the first place. Mount Street is, I mean, how many, how, how many minutes walk is Mount Street away from Leinster House? Not very many, Gary. It's in the heart of very prosperous George in Dublin. And I, maybe, maybe I'm off the completely wrong here, but my suspicion is that if you had a situation like this similar, near Palazzo Chigi in Rome or near the, the Elysee Paris in Paris, it simply wouldn't happen. It, you just wouldn't be allowed to create that kind of bidonville in the, in the middle of the city like this. It wouldn't. And the concomitant problems that come with having a, a, a large number of human beings without access to toilet facilities, etc. That's just not acceptable in the, in, the, in the capital city. Then you decide you're going to do something about it because for whatever reason, it's suddenly become obvious and it's become a a problem for you at a media level or a perception level. And also you have the St. Patrick's Day weekend coming up and there's going to be a lot of people around the city. So you, let's do something. And they can't even do that. They can't manage a situation. We weren't talking about hundreds and hundreds of people, as I understand it. The fact that it wasn't within their wish to be able to provide some kind of a solution that didn't produce even more ridiculous footage afterwards of the same people going into this place. As you say, there's a certain amount of lack of clarity about precisely where they were they were brought to see them on the side of the road heading back into town. The whole thing is just a complete failure of basic competence. No, I mean, we had heard that the people who were living there uh, that they had started some sort of basically dirty protest to the to the center that was beside them mm-hmm. and we had we had actually planned to send people down to it. i think ben went down the day before it was moved um when i think it had been tidied up a bit so we're never able to verify that but it was interesting actually uh, some of these migrant spaces these migrant camps when you see them and you see the images from them there's a lot of political imagery about the place a lot of should we say, Michael, far left political imagery about the place, mm-hmm. slogans, yeah, yeah. icons, things of that nature. Almost like that there is some degree of agitation happening there from our more progressive friends. But again, we were never able to stand that up. I think what you talk about on competency is important. But I think it is stuff like this is also important to see because it has become so prevalent in modern politics both on the left and the right, to be perfectly honest, although the left is more built around it, to talk about the endless good we can do and building a better world and how we all need to link hands and sing. And the question of resources, of resource allocation, of limitations is always dealt with in this sort of, well, you just don't care enough about people. But no, this is the logical and inevitable outcome of a policy which does not see itself as constrained by resource or environment. Yes. And that can only get you so far. It was always going to end the way it has ended. Even were the government competent, the difficulty of building the infrastructure that would be needed to handle something like this would have still taken time. It would have gotten this bad inevitably. 
And when you look at the numbers, I mean, there's an effectively a limitless amount of people who want to come to the West. There is no level of infrastructure development which can sustain that level of growth. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lack of re- willingness to, re- to, to face up to the recognition or to face up to the fact of the number of people that do want to come here and to make a decision ourselves, whether it is corporately as the European Union or individually as, as sovereign nations, how we want to respond to that fact. Pew, which is, I think we've probably uh, talked about this before, but Pew is a very reputable international polling organization. And this is a question that it, it polls on regularly. And one, they said, in one poll recently, fairly recently, I think, what, something like 700, 800 million people in Africa would like to live in Europe. No, we don't need 700, 800 million people in Africa to turn up to cause a problem. I'm saying that we, we have to recognize that if, if we want to say that coming from a place of deep, deep economic deprivation and misery, is a sufficient reason for us to assume an obligation to accept those people. Well, then we have to recognise what the consequences of that position is going to be. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that we do or we don't take that position. I have an opinion. But if we're going to go down that, then you have to recognise we are operating within the constraints of the resources. I mean, I, I, I imagine you saw this story in the Business Post, Gary, which said that the, de- the department... Uh, has advised uh, the Darrow Brain, isn't it? That at the moment we are, the government target is based on uh, around the idea of building thirty three thousand houses a year. When the requirement is to build fifty thousand houses a year, so even if we succeed, and building has in product. Production has increased by 60%. And as it says, there are very significant subsidies and inducements being put in place by the government to stimulate demand in the construction industry. But even if we get 33,000 in one year, that's 17,000 short. If we do 33,000 in two years, that's 34,000 houses short. You don't have to be brilliant to work out what that's going to mean over a period of time. We are already under producing and over and over capacity at the moment. And we have to recognize that that's the reality and do something about that. And we have to either both at the supply and the demand level, and we have to make a decision. We can't just go around pie in the sky nonsense. I found there was a quite interesting series of articles in the Irish Times, I think about a week ago. Um, And it was on uh, wealthy Chinese buyers buying up homes in Dublin. Yes. And how this was inflating the prices of those areas and putting pressure on people in those areas. And it was quite interesting because there has been a general reticence amongst Irish media in the last maybe 10 years, maybe actually closer to, you know, five, six, seven, to say that additional people from from immigrating into the country could actually put pressure on things. It just seems to be something we don't talk, which is strange, because if you go back to, you know, the Celtic Tiger, it was actually a topic of considerable discussion. But now it seems like there's an unwillingness to talk about it. And this is the first article I've seen on on it in in quite a while. But yes, it's obvious. If the population is increasing massively... And the Irish population is increasing substantially. And infrastructure does not keep track with that. Inflation is the only option you can expect. If you have insufficient supply and you introduce into the market extra demand, it's not hard to work out what the consequences of that are. Doesn't that extra demand cut from could, from, could come from Africa, it could come from China, it could come from Butovant or Cork. It doesn't matter. We have had a problem talking about this because a lot of the extra demand was coming from outside the country and people became uncomfortable with that. For a long time, people were saying, well, one of the problems in Dublin is we have all these big tech companies coming in and employing people with big wages and that's out pricing out 
people in the rest of Dublin who aren't on that kind of income. Well, if you don't have the supply and you increase demand, well, then that means the prices will go up. Now, it seems to me, and we've talked about this far too often, the problem is that this the government has since, oh God, at this stage, getting on for 15 years, has resolutely refused to address the problem of supply and in fact has created problems for increasing that supply. And it was obvious 10 years ago at this stage, yeah, for yeah, 10, certainly eight years ago, cert I would say 10 years ago, certainly eight years ago, it was obvious that we had a problem with supply. And now we're desperately trying to play catch up and we are so far from catching up, it is ridiculous. It is, it is somewhat strange because there was a willingness to discuss kind of the positives of economic migration, basically a larger population, more consumption, more potential for businesses. But even that kind of has dried up over the last few years, and now it just seems to be a thing we don't talk about. Yeah, well, listen, I'm I'm a free trader. I'm an open market kind of guy. I think that if you look at the, the way this economy turned around from the state it was in, say, in 1987, to the state that it has been for the last 20, 30 years, a very large amount of that goes back to our success in attracting foreign direct investment. And I think it would be bizarre for us at this stage to turn and say that we regret attracting all the large pharma companies, the large tech companies, the communication companies. And we regret the fact that we've gone from a situation where we were high double digits on employment to full employment to a situation where we had less than a million people in employment over two million people in employment this is all good stuff these are positives but they carry with them consequences and there has been a severe failure on the behalf of the state to properly manage and deal with and plan for the consequences of economic success i think so I, one of the things i i often wonder about is whether or not the multinationals and Ireland's reliance on them has created effectively a form of Dutch disease mm. in the Irish economy. Well, there, there, was a, there was a report on that recently which said that we had avoided the Dutch disease, but kind of sort of avoided it. That we still, we had problems, that we, but we had essentially avoided the Dutch disease. Yeah, I mean, I've seen things saying we haven't, doesn't quite match and you know, there were risks, but they never actually actualized. But it's always just one of those things that I'm kind of curious, more so when we look back on it. Yeah. We, the, it, it, where, where people are going to fall on it. It's always going to be a retrospective thing. Not one thing we can say with a, a degree of confidence is that we are now in a position where revenue has become actively dependent on corporate taxation and from corporate, ta prof, corporate taxation from a, a ridiculously limited number of, com of foreign companies. And that kind of situation is not good for your broader economy. We need to diversify. We need to start becoming far less revenue reliant on corporate tax receipts from those companies. Um, and we need to, we need to fairly quickly because, well, we know what happened the last time we became reliant on receipts from revenue that we wouldn't normally be in, which was around 2007, 2008. And that did not end well. I suppose it's actually just for those who of you, of those listeners who are not terribly informed about economic theories, what touch disease actually is. There's a couple of different ways to describe it. I think a general description, which would give you an idea of it, is to say that it refers to where one sector of the economy, um, traditionally kind of natural resources, you know, oil, gas, things like that. It was gas for the Dutch, wasn't it? The, the Dutch got a massive infusion of, of, of cash in the 70s for the development of their natural, natural gas fields. Um, where one sector of the economy rapidly develops or rapidly becomes um, a major component of the economic mix. And it basically pulls in resources from other sectors, particularly you know, human resources, mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. um, and other sectors become underdeveloped and kind of straggle uh, can be deeply deeply damaging and i think ireland has certain traits of it particularly with relation to the indigenous um businesses and particularly the government approach to them 
But that is that is kind of beside the point. There was um, one thing just on the migration issue we were talking about, Michael, that I always I think is worth mentioning. I've seen a lot of people, Leo, there talking about climate change and climate refugees and what that's going to look like and that there are hundreds of millions of people who could be affected and want to move into Europe. And these people generally then start talking about, you know, how Europe will have to deal with this and, you know, the integration policies and things of that nature, which seems to ignore two realities. One is that Europe will not be able to deal with that. No, it's never happened that you've been able to integrate that many people moving that quickly uh, from that many places. It would simply never happen. And the follow on to that is that, well, they tend to say, you know, Europe will have to deal with these people because of refugee requirements and asylum seeking requirements. The simple fact of the matter is if that things ever became that bad, those requirements would become totally inoperable and companies would or countries would refuse to abide by them. It will never happen that Europe will have to consider those amount of people under existing regulations because the mere possibility of it will cause them to rapidly harden their stances and probably correctly. No, at that point, we would effectively no longer be in peacetime. It will be, a, if you like, wartime. And in war in wartime, different rules apply. Now, I'm saying wartime, obviously, figuratively, Gary, figuratively. Yeah, I think it comes from a lot of these people believe in international law as a standalone thing, whereas international law is not like national law. International law is largely a figment where the nation's states agree to operate under that constraint. But at any moment, they could decide, no, we're not doing that anymore. And all of the NGOs and all of the international legal professionals can complain, but there's no oversight over them. They can do what they want, which is why it differs from national law, where if you disagree with the police, the uh, form of uh, force used on you will escalate until they kill you. And on that cheerful note, Gary, I think since it is the bank holiday weekend, we'll draw a veil over this and let the people out because some of them may be suffering. Also, I'm not sure how long I can actually talk for without my computer deciding to kill itself again. But actually, on I, I will give you an actual cheerful thing to end this on, Michael. Please do. So the NWCI has been in the papers uh, this week, obviously because of the referendum. The Irish Times did a nice little report on how SIPO has basically no oversight over the NGOs and what they spend and started talking about, you know, the McKenna judgment. All stuff I'm sure the NWCI does not want to be linked to the conversation about. However, the uh, RTE has a piece on them on how the NWCI says it spent around 50000 on the Yes campaign. But here is a description they use of the NWCI, which I thought you would love. The organization, which receives some state funding, has been criticized for campaigning for yes. <laughs> receives some state funding. Yes, as opposed to 96% of its staffing costs are paid for directly by the state. Mm. Nicely put. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's not untrue. I mean, it's perfectly true. It's just, uh, you know, maybe not what I would have said. I think you're being almost kind in saying it's not untrue. But anyway, it's very close to being it. I think if you were to take a survey of people and ask them, on a scale of 1 to 100, if somebody said, I get some of my money from uh, the sale of chocolate bars, what percentage of you would you think that was? Below this, below that, below... I don't think many people would say 97%, but anyway, there you go. No. That is an interesting stat because I've seen it all around the place, but never accredited to the person who found it out, Michael, which I think is deeply unfair. Very. Because that person is me. <laughs> okay. I've written two articles this year for Gripped, both bangers. <laughs> Productivity, that's what it's all about, Gary Cott. Anyway, we should be back on Sunday, all things being well. Have a good week. All the best.